scanning for audio. In a land of myth and a time of magic, the destiny of a great kingdom rests on the shoulders of a young boy. His name... Once again to the Tin Dog Podcast, number 76. 76, hey, who would have thought? Anyway, this week we're talking about Battlefield, but before I do, I just want to thank everyone who's been emailing in of late. Thanks very much, especially people who enjoyed the Halloween special poem all about the 1980s hiatus. At the end of this podcast, there's going to be a bit of an announcement, so if you hang on till then, I'm sure you'll hear something to your mutual benefit. However, onwards, onwards, ever onwards. Oh, I'm rambling before I've even started. Battlefield. The Region 2 DVD of Battlefield comes out on the 29th of December this year, and it's a wonderful two-disc set. I'll go over what's on each disc later on, but of course what we really need to discuss is the story itself. With it coming out on the 29th of December, it does mean that all of those little DVD vouchers and gift tokens that you get given can all go to a wonderful place. You may or may not know anything about Battlefield. A lot of people don't like it. And of course I just need to say that you're wrong. Yeah, I like McCoy. I'm not going to make any statement otherwise about that. And to me, Battlefield is superb. There are three different incarnations of Battlefield. The first one is the one that was on TV in Doctor Who's last official ordinary series in 1989 that people could take off the TV and just watch it whenever they wanted. The second incarnation is the novelization. Now that wasn't written by Ben Aranovich, who wrote the original script. No, it was written by Mark Platt, who as we all know wrote Ghostlight. This adaptation has even more information about the story than we saw on screen. The third and final incarnation, as I speak, is the second disc in the two DVD set. Similar in many respects to the previous Sylvester McCoy release, Curse of Fenric, it has what I can only describe as a tarted up version of the original story. Effects have been replaced, augmented and improved. Some missing footage, previously seen on the VHS release but not as part of the episode, have been reinstated, providing a nice narrative with extra footage and everything holds together much, much better. This third version is great. It's worth the price of the DVD alone. And so what's it all about, this battlefield of which I speak? The basic premise behind the entire story is one that I'm surprised never occurred to any other Doctor Who writers, or if it did occur, was never actually made. The Doctor is Merlin. It's that simple. Hence the opening sequence in this week's episode of the TDP. It's not a past Doctor, however, It's a future Doctor, and the reason for this lies at the very core of Ben's original concept. Ben had written originally the very successful Dalek story, Remembrance of the Daleks, seen only a year before. This story is the antithesis of that very same story. Aspects of the original Dalek story have been taken and twisted, turned on their head. The Doctor turns up The Doctor turns up in the Dalek story to deal with things from his own past. Here, he deals with things from his own future, his potential future. One day he will be Merlin. Possibly. In an alternate universe. I'll discuss more about how this alternate universe business starts and fits and works in a moment. But let's get back to this whole, it's the opposite of the Dalek story theme. In the Dalek story, the Doctor deals with the military who are against him. Here, he deals with the military who are with him. He's also dealing, primarily, with weapons of mass destruction. Of course, the phrase itself wasn't even mentioned then. But in the Dalek story, he's dealing with the Hand of Omega. He ends up with a baseball bat, which has powers. Here, he's dealing with the Great Destroyer, a big blue demon. An atomic warhead, which is kind of thrown into the plot for no adequately explored reason, other than the extremely good 
anti-war speech given out, not written by Aranovich, but rather written by the script editor. But most importantly is the Doctor's relationship with the on-screen villain. In the Dalek story, Davros, the Emperor Dalek, or whatever you want to call them, cannot be reasoned with. In this story, the villains can, because Aranovich has taken aspects of the Arthurian myth, just enough that we're familiar with, twisted it slightly and given it back to us. The way that the Arthurian myth is treated is best summed up in this section taken from the extended version. Professor, we've sussed out where the legend of King Arthur came from. Uh, I'm sorry, Miss um, oh, Young Lady, but uh, the Doctor and I have important matters to discuss. We reckon that when Anselin's lot dumped the freeze-dried king in the lake, they must have told the story to some local. But they couldn't handle the more outre aspects. So they translated it into terms they could understand. And so old Frozen Chicken becomes king of the Britons. Doctor, I really must... No, Brigadier, this is important. Since that's Excalibur... It must be the source of Arthur's power. And a vital control element to the spaceship under the lake. It wasn't stuck in the stone. It was plugged in. When recording the Tin Dog podcast, I like to insert samples taken from the episode to illustrate certain points. This story is almost infinitely quotable. It's got some superb lines. Things like the Brigadier saying... My Lord Merlin. Merlin? Oh, he has many names. (laughs) many faces. And he has many companions. This must be the latest one. We've checked the perimeter. Dr. Wormsley's staying with the vehicles. Oh, thank you, Bambera. Oh, see if you can get a blanket for this young lady, will you? Yes, sir. Perhaps I should make some tea, too. Well, are you all right, uh, Miss... Um... Just call me the latest one, and I can get my own blanket. Oh, dear. Women, not really my field. Don't worry, Brigadier. People will be shooting at you soon. Even Sylvester McCoy at some point shouting, There will be no battle here! They're all great things. A moment for me that is superb in this story is when the Doctor asks Ace about Clark's law. They say, Who grows spaceships? Very advanced bioengineers. That's a stupid question. Well, if they're grown, how do they fly? Magic. It'll be feasible, Professor. What is Clark's law? Well, any advanced form of technology is indistinguishable from magic. Well, the reverse is true. Any advanced form of magic is indistinguishable. Which is wonderful. And for the child I was when I was watching this story, it really got my imagination going. It crosses that line between fantasy and science fiction quite, quite well. And in the extended version, this conversation takes place in a much better setting than on the original. Certain aspects of the original left a lot to be desired. Some of the effects weren't great, and some of it felt a little rushed. The tweaks and the touches up that have happened in this new version genuinely help. I know some people want to experience the original in its glorious... I don't want to use the word wobbly set because we all know on Doctor Who the sets actually didn't wobble. Some of the monsters wobbled, but the sets didn't. I was actually spot for choice when trying to find samples to put into this story. So many wonderful quotable lines are here. And yet the story is disliked by its original author. Only on this commentary has he finally come back to examine the story as a whole and been more impressed than he actually thought he would be. This is a good thing. All right, it doesn't rank with the wonderful classics, but I still think it is underrated massively. It's well worth looking at. McCoy's Doctor is not to everyone's taste. This is where he's at his best as an action character, and his relationship with Ace, the Brigadier, that's the original Brigadier, the new Brigadier, Winifred Bambera, played by a Geordie actress, yes. It's nice to be able to claim the Brigadier, A Brigadier as a Geordie. Oddly enough, the guy who plays the original Brigadier, Lethbridge Stewart, who will be appearing in the Sarah Jane story at the end of this current series, and that's something I'm so looking forward to, is a big fan of Newcastle United, the football team. You see, if you live in America, you really just think I'm going off at a tangent. I'm going to get back to the plot now, okay? This story has a very good supporting cast. An argument could be made for Chow Young, a character who only appears in this one story, 
being the Sally Sparrow at the end of the McCoy era. That I'll leave for your own argument amongst yourselves. But I can see her making a great companion. Adventurous like Ace, but with a different standpoint and a different take on things. She would have made a good companion. There are lots and lots of theories linked with this story. Things that people often say in passing. Taken as fan fact, things such as Sylvester McCoy winks the same eye that apparently Merlin gave up in order to get wisdom. But Merlin only gave up his eye to get wisdom in certain versions of the story. And those versions of the story are actually reworkings of the Odin myth taken from Norse mythology. And that's fine. That's something we can all deal with and we can all think about. And what else do you get on this disc? Well, there's a very nice making of documentary where the writer deals with some of the issues brought up by the story and its making, as well as the history behind it. A commentary with Sophie and a host of others, including the writer and both brigadiers. And of course, a small section dealing with the famous water tank incident. Now, for those of you unfamiliar with the story, the character of Ace is trapped for a few moments inside a rapidly filling tank of water before she's ejected from a spacecraft. Yes, the spacecraft happens to be underwater. I'd rather not give out too many spoilers on this one. Suffice to say that the actress, Sophie, was encased indeed in this large glass cabinet and which was rapidly filling with water. And on the day, the cabinet cracked. Sylvester let out a cry and pulled her out. Everyone ran for the hills on the grounds that water and electricity cables in a studio never really mix well. And the Sylvester saved Sophie. It's the sort of story that gets told a lot at conventions. It's nicely recreated here and you get to find out all the facts. The odd part of this is, is if anyone remembers the Gary Downey interview just before he died in Doctor Who magazine, where he says the whole thing was blown out of proportion. Watching it now, I can't see how it could have been blown out of proportion at all. But as Gary is no longer with us, you can't really ask him questions about that. I detect another mine. Eight out of ten listeners who expressed a preference say they prefer the Tin Dog Podcast. We certainly do over here at Staggering Stories. Dot net. Dot net. Dot net. Dot net. The other mind has now left the Matrix. The Doctor always was Merlin. That's fine. And I know I've said this before and I'll probably say it again a thousand times. But Big Finish are missing a trick. A nice series of unbound stories dealing with the backstory in this particular story. You can cast any Doctor you want. It's a future thing. You can have multiple Doctors, that's also not a problem. Merlin Unbound. The perfect spin-off miniseries. Ah, it'll never happen. And if it does, I'll be the first to buy it. Crashing on. Originally the character of the Brigadier was meant to be killed off in this story. And as he's in the new Sarah Jane Smith adventure, you can figure out whether he survives the story or not. This story, of course, throws up massive issues with unit dating. Yeah, we've covered all this elsewhere when unit stories are meant to be set, when are they not set, what's going on, is Sarah Jane Smith really from 1980 or is she from the 70s? This story just confuses matters even more, because it's meant to be set in a future. Not just the references to Merlin and the Doctor's future incarnations, no, it's meant to be set in our future. Now remember this was originally 1989 when we were watching it, so we were thinking it was set in the distant future of something like 1995, which is fine from the standpoint of 1989. In it, the story is mentioned as that there could be a king. There are five pound coins. People have car phones. All the road signs are in kilometres. It makes much more sense for this story itself to have taken place in a slightly off-centre parallel world, not necessarily ours. It seems to be the same world of Modern of the Undead, but even that sort of thing's open for debate. Like most unit things, it's best not to look at it too closely and just accept it for what it is. A very nice collection of tales. Things that were in the book version, that weren't in the TV version, that have a wonderful piece of atmosphere, and I so recommend you track down a copy of the Battlefield novelization. It's a glorious piece of literature, and it is literature, it's not just an adaptation. You get the cyborg armour, akin to the faction paradox stuff worn later by Time Lords, rather than the standard armour that you saw on screen. You also get to see Arthur's original death and his journey to the ship, and lots and lots of other things. Backstory, story about how the Brigadier ended up with Doris, all worthy of a read. Reading? Why read when we can watch a DVD? Yeah, I can see your argument. But dig it out, trust me. It'll only cost you a quid or so. 
And with that, I'll fade away. Suffice to say, one more piece of news. This is the news I mentioned earlier on. For the next few weeks, the Tin Dog Podcast might be fading away just slightly, but it's not going anywhere. The reason is, is that I'm helping out, co-presenting, the WhoCast, while Tony is ill. So, if you need your fix of me, then switch over and download the newest WhoCast, and I'll be there, rambling with Trevor. Get well soon, Tony, and come back to us. And with that, I'll play the full version of the WhoCast's theme tune. So until next time, be seeing you. listening to the Tin Dog Podcast. Doctor Who and its associated shows are all trademark of the BBC. No infringement is intended. Contact us at tin-dog at hotmail.co.uk.